Uh, hello, good afternoon and welcome everyone to the first in our series of Wild Isles webinars. Um, and this is a walk through our wonderful woodlands. This webinar is an hour and 15 minutes long with talks and videos from our experts before giving you the chance to ask your questions in the Q&A. My name is Jamie Wyver and I work at the RSPB on the mag magazine that we send out every quarter for members, the RSPB magazine, but also our weekly email to supporters, Notes on Nature, which I know many of you read. Today I have the wonderful job of introducing our speakers, but first we've got some important online housekeeping to make you aware of. Now, as this is a Zoom webinar, uh, you won't be able to turn on your video or microphone, but you will be able to ask questions using the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We might not get time to answer everyone's questions during the session, but we will aim to get back to you at a future date if you haven't asked it anonymously. Please don't wait until the end of the presentations to ask your question. Just pop them in the Q&A box as they occur to you and let us and, and it would help actually if you know who the question's for. So put the speaker's name at the beginning of your question. This webinar is being recorded. There will be a poll this afternoon. This will pop up on your screens automatically and it would be great if you could answer, but please don't feel obliged to do so. There will be a survey at the end, which will come up on your screen automatically once the webinar is ended. It would be great to get your feedback on the webinar. However, again, please don't feel that you have to take part. If you have any technical issues, there is someone from our events team with us today who might be able to help. Although for some Zoom related issues, we might not be able to offer any support. To kick us off this afternoon, Andrew Wetherill will be telling us all about our woodlands and why they are so special, followed by a video of the beautiful Horsewater in Cumbria by Lee Schofield, before we hear about the amazing Cairngorms Connect programme from Jeremy Roberts. So let's introduce our first speaker. Now, Andrew Wetherill is the RSPB's Principal Policy Officer for Woodlands and Forestry, and that means he leads on this topic across the UK. He has a forestry degree and PhD from Aberdeen and is a chartered forester. He joined the RSPB after lecturing and researching on woodlands and forestry at the National School of Forestry in Cumbria. I'm now going to pass over to Andrew to begin the webinar. Andrew. Oh, hello. Thank you, Jamie. And, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see that now, Jamie. Yep, that's there. Thanks, Andrew. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, well, I'm incredibly conscious that for most of you, um, the last person you, that you heard talking about Woodlands was actually Sir David Attenborough on Sunday night and what a brilliant program it was. Um, and clearly you'll hear from my accent, uh, I'm not Sir David Attenborough, I am, uh, as Jamie said, Principal Policy Officer with the RSPB, but I thought it would be helpful just to give you a little bit about, about me first of all, so that you know who your host is on this part of the virtual walk. So uh, yeah, as I say, uh, with my accent, I'm from an urban area in the south of England. I now live in the northwest of England in a more rural area. Um, and I never thought growing up that I would have the opportunity to work for uh, a conservation organization, think about trees and woods and even about birds. So it's a tremendous privilege to be here. But what I want to get across is that there was nothing um, remarkable about my my childhood and upbringing that led me to this uh, position um, here today. I'm not the kind of person who can uh, instantly recognize the birds uh, in the trees. I'm better at the trees themselves. Uh, I use my RSPB uh, bird guide all the time. And usually I'm the kind of person who is uh, still struggling with the focus on their binoculars by the time the bird I want to look at has um, flown away. So uh, in that aspect, I'm sure that there are many of you in the audience today who are better at your bird identification uh, than I am. And many of you will know lots about trees, woods and forests and their management already. Uh, but just to set the scene, especially for our other two speakers, I'm going to go through some of the big, the big global and UK picture around woodlands uh, and forests. And yes, uh, just to point out that the nuthatch, when I get to see it, is, is my favourite bird. I'm sure you've all got a favourite as well. So uh, what am I going to talk about? Um, 
it's always nice to present a list where you've already ticked the first thing off. So I've already said who I am. I'm going to talk a little bit about the global forestry story on today, uh, International Day of Forests. Uh, the International Days are a, a United Nations uh, idea. And yeah, today is the forestry one. It has a theme each year. Uh, this year's theme is healthy forests for healthy people. Uh, within this talk, we're predominantly uh, focusing on the healthy forests part of it. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the UK woodland story as well, and then focus down on my favourite kind of woodlands in the UK, which is ancient woodlands. Uh, talk a little bit about one particular species as well, the lesser spotted woodpecker, and then come back to the general point connected to the wonderful Wild Isles program, which is uh, what we need to do to be saving our Wild Isles, the woodlands uh, and the associated biodiversity. So the global forestry story, just some real big picture uh, stuff here. Um, they cover 31% of our total land area globally. That's 3-1%. Um, and that's so approximately a third of the land cover. But they store um, greater than 50% of the carbon stocks in their soils and vegetation combined. And they are thought to have roughly 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity associated uh, with them, whether that's as woodland species or species that are partly in woodlands and partly in other habitat sites uh, using the, uh, the full landscape matrix. So what that means is for the land area of about a third, woodlands are contributing globally more um, in terms of combating the climate emergency, and more in terms of providing habitat for biodiversity. So we should cherish them and value them. Uh, they can contribute to our nature positive net zero future because they are already providing benefits for us all. I'll come now to the UK forestry story. Sadly, those figures just um, reverse those two numbers there. So um, in the UK, uh, woodlands and forests cover only 13%, 1-3% of our total land area, uh, so lower than the global average, which considering our place uh, uh, within the world, you would expect us to have more woodland and forest cover. Um, one thing that's interesting uh, in the UK is to think about where the carbon is. It's uh, predominantly in the soil, more than 50% of it. So anybody who's managing trees, woodlands and forests from the point of view of uh, climate mitigation, new IPCC report has just come out, should think of themselves as a custodian of soil. Soil is described as the least renewable part of an ecosystem because once you've lost it, you can't really get it back. Um, peatlands are really important for carbon storage, but in terms of carbon capture, taking carbon outside, uh, out of the atmosphere and storing it, um, the highest rates are achieved by woodlands and forests. So they're really important in that point of view as well. Uh, unfortunately for biodiversity, the situation is a little bit more complex in the UK because while we've been increasing our woodlands and forest cover, 80% uh, increase uh, since 1965, we're seeing a decline in, in woodland biodiversity. Um, specifically, we can track that through woodland specialist birds, those birds that are really adapted to uh, woodland conditions. And sadly, we've seen a 45% decrease in approximately the same time scale, so since 1970. Um, and so that means that while woodlands and forestry should contribute to our nature positive future, um, they're not doing as much as we would like. And that is partly because the kind of woodlands and forests that we have created uh, in the last 50 years, uh, in the last 100 years even, are predominantly um, non-native plantations. Now, they have their purpose. It's really imp important that we try and produce timber as well. Um, 
However, we want to think about how all our trees, woods and forests can be better uh, to, to tackle the, the dual uh, nature and climate emergency. I'll now talk briefly about ancient woodlands, which cover just 2.5% of our land area. So this is the kind of woodlands we would have had uh, in the past before the impact of of humans, particularly in land clearances for agriculture. Um, but ancient woodlands are important also for carbon because they store 37% more carbon per hectare than all woodland types together. Um, and that's just in the biomass. They also have relatively undisturbed soil, so we can think of them as um, probably containing more carbon in their soils as well because carbon is released when you have disturbance. We're really amazingly fortunate in the United Kingdom to have temperate woodland which is the kind of lowland mixed deciduous woodland that most people are used to seeing. On the across western upland Britain we've also got temperate rainforest uh, and, and horse water would be a good example here which Lee will talk about later and we've even got a fragment of the boreal forest in the Caledonian pinewood part of which Jen will talk about regarding Cairngorms Connect. So ancient woodlands are really important, all woodlands are important but ancient woodlands are especially important. Sadly even though they're just down, they're down to just 2.5% of our land area, we're still losing them. 981 have been lost since 1999, and over 1,000, 1,225 are currently threatened. And what we can see in terms of the pattern of threat is that usually about half in the last 20 years of those threatened have been lost. So we really need to protect as well as improve and connect our ancient woodland fragments. Very quick story now about the lesser spotted woodpecker. Uh, lesser spotted woodpecker was named because of its size relative to the greater spotted woodpecker. Uh, very clear distinctions between them in other ways as well, but size was the predominant one. However, because it's become so low in numbers, it's now monitored by the Reed, Rare Breeding Birds panel. And so that means that that name has become really sadly prophetic in a way that the lesser spotted woodpecker, you're now more likely to see it in a drawing even than a great photograph from a woodland. So for me, what success would look like in our wonderful woodlands in terms of protecting and improving them is to be able to go out and walk in the woods and not necessarily see all this wonderful wildlife, but feel like you've got the opportunity to see it. So finally, uh, what should we be doing? I've talked about protecting and improving already. We do need that expansion as well from the 13%. So we need to think about where are the right places for trees? What are the good reasons for planting them there? Um, and then, you know, how to get them in, into, the, into the ground. So, so it's a place-based, place-first based approach to this. Um, and then sometimes we can do that with natural colonization around the boundaries of ancient woodlands. Sometimes it will be planting, especially to connect them. On an individual level, uh, everybody can volunteer, everybody can join campaigns, people can even donate if they can afford it. I know it's a cost of living crisis. Uh, just attending something like this is hopefully uh, part of getting more education about the issues. And for younger people, perhaps people listening now, uh, watching now, or perhaps people that you know, pursuing a conservation career is also uh, an option. Uh, this last photo I'm showing here is just from uh, the train station this morning. I saw this. This was a, just a little display at the side of the station. So I've not written this, but it shows that anybody can develop the expertise to know the facts and, and, and present them. So opportunities for all. I just wanted to finish. The, it, most of the images I've used have been from the RSPB. I haven't named the individual photographers, but thanks to all of them. But this is just a photo of me working in one of our wonderful woodlands. This is the high, highest Atlantic oak wood in England, the UK, probably the world or even the multiverse. And that's where I am happiest. So I just want to say thank you for listening um, and back to Jamie. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. I have to say, nuthatch is one of my favourite birds too. 
um woodlands are really really special um so i i, I should just say actually some brilliant questions coming in which we'll return to later i was having a sneaky peek at them um andrew will come back to you with some questions later so feel free to pop your pop your mic and your camera off have a have a rest um, but please do add your questions. I think we've got about nine in there already, but please add your questions for Andrew in the Q&A box. Now, next up, we've got a video of Horsewater. Lee Schofield is the RSPB Senior Site Manager at Horsewater, which is a landscape scale site on the Lake District National Park, where the RSPB is working in partnership with Landowner United Utilities to improve the landscape for wildlife, water and people. Lee has written a book about their work at Halls of Water called Wildfell, there we are, um, available on our website, on the RSPB shop, um, all purchases there, support conservation, um, and also all good bookshops. Now, Lee will be joining us, I can see him there, hello Lee, uh, Julie, Lee will be joining us a little bit later on in the Q&A, so don't forget to put your questions for him in the box, in the Q&A box, as they occur to you while you watch this video. So please watch this video and enjoy, thank you. Tucked away at the eastern edge of the Lake District National Park, Horswater Reservoir sits encircled by looming fells. The glacially carved landscape is studded with mossy woodlands, rocky crags, bogs, tarns and rushing streams. The whole area is owned by water company United Utilities, and the reservoir supplies two million people with their daily drinking water. In 2011, the RSPB began managing Nadal and Swindale farms, which together with their associated common land, extend to around 30 square kilometres, roughly a third of the Hawes Water drinking water catchment. Working together with United Utilities, we are demonstrating how ecological restoration can work alongside sustainable upland farming, benefiting water, wildlife and people. This is how the landscape looked in 2011. From this perspective, Nadal in the centre and Swindale to the left and their associated areas of common land are undoubtedly beautiful, full of Lake District grandeur. However, on closer inspection, major ecological issues stand out. The rich ancient woodland clothing the slopes around Nadal Farm and the recovering heathland above were isolated, separated from surrounding land by the fences which protected them. Intensive grazing by both sheep and deer meant that the open common land and enclosed farmland were not in good shape, dominated by species-poor acid grassland and bracken. As a result of damaging post-war financial incentives, large areas of peat bog had been drained to try to improve them for farming. This reduced the bog's vital water and carbon storage capacity, creating a whole host of problems for people and for nature. The drainage scars in the bog were visible from miles away, Although England's only resident Golden Eagle was still present in 2011, he'd been on his own for around five years, a clear sign of the landscape's poor condition. Elsewhere on the fells, the bird life was very limited. Upland surveys would often record meadow pipits and skylarks and very little else. In Swindale, the beck ran as straight as a canal, having been engineered to drain surrounding farmland at least 200 years earlier with the unintended consequence of increasing flood risk for people downstream and robbing it of its value to wildlife. The valley's precious hay meadows were in poor shape due to overgrazing and fertiliser use. Supported by Natural England and many other partners, the RSPB and United Utilities are working towards addressing all of these issues and doing so in a way that brings benefits for the local community and economy. Ecological restoration is a slow process in the uplands, but here's what we might expect the landscape to look like by 2050. As a result of both planting and natural regeneration, trees will have spread onto higher ground, particularly in areas dominated by bracken, which indicates where woodland probably grew historically. Many fences will have been removed, and the boundaries between woods, heaths, bog and grassland will have become blurry creating a much more diverse set of conditions for wildlife. There will be more trees in the enclosed land too, with livestock benefiting from the shade and shelter that infield trees provide. More hedges will provide vital habitat for wildlife and help with livestock management. 
While still recognisably a farmed landscape, the animals doing the grazing will be different. Sheep will still be present, but in lower numbers and only grazing on the enclosed land within the farm boundaries. Up on the commons, a scattering of hardy cattle and fell ponies, grazing alongside a low density of wild deer, will mimic a natural, wild grazing regime that occurred here thousands of years ago. These heavy-footed animals will help to distribute the seeds of trees and flowers and create gaps for them to grow, keeping the landscape diverse. The area's cast of breeding birds will have grown. As reintroduced populations expand, it's likely that white-tailed eagles and red kites will be back in Horswater skies, alongside golden eagles spreading out from Scotland. Species like cuckoo, curlew and windchat will be thriving thanks to the healthy mosaic of habitats. Looking at the landscape from this lofty perspective can only show so much. We must look more closely to appreciate the finer details. By blocking drains and revegetating areas of bare peat, the bogs will be wet and wild again. Without the drains, the flow of water through the landscape will be slower, encouraging the growth of healthy carpets of sphagnum moss, locking in carbon from the atmosphere as they grow. Carnivorous sundews, fluffy cotton grass and bright yellow bog asphodel will thrive in the damp conditions, as will dragonflies, snipe and curlew, and many other wetland specialists. Black grouse will be back, making use of the bog and the scrub on the drier ground. Having had its bends put back, the Swindale Beck will meander through colourful hay meadows, which will still be managed in the traditional way to provide flowery hay to the livestock during the winter months. Freed from man-made constraints, the beck will spill out onto the floodplain more frequently and periodically change its course as natural rivers do. The beck's gravelly bed will be a spawning ground for salmon and banks will be home to water voles, otters and kingfishers. Down in the mossy woodlands, pied flycatchers, woodcock and red squirrels would have been joined by pine martins, helping to keep the grey squirrels under control. Through the careful management of deer, there will be a healthy mixture of young and old trees. These woodlands are our native rainforests, and by enabling them to spread, will ensure that species like tree lungwort lichen and pied flycatchers will have a secure, long-term future. Other new species will have arrived. Whether through reintroduction or by natural spread, beavers will be working their magic in wetland areas such as in Nadal Valley. By holding back water with their leaky, filtering dams, they'll not only help to reduce flooding downstream, but they'll also keep water in the landscape for longer during dry spells, contributing to a sustainable, clean supply into Horswater Reservoir. The wetlands they'll have created will be teeming with amphibians, water voles, fish, birds and insects, providing a wonderful wildlife spectacle for visitors. By 2050, we'll have shown that our approach is as good for people as it is for nature. A sustainable farming operation, the tree nursery, wildlife hides, accommodation, education, scientific research and a range of other activities will provide an array of diverse employment and volunteering opportunities, helping to support the local community. Over the course of centuries, Nadal and Swindale, like all farms in the Lake District, have responded to the changing demands of society. By focusing on improving water quality, reducing flood risk, improving wildlife habitats and locking up carbon in trees and soils, alongside sustainable food production, the RSPB and United Utilities are continuing in that proud tradition here at Wild Horsewater. Wow. What a great video. The work going on at Horsewater is just incredible and it shows how when we work in partnership, when organisations join together, a landowner, a conservation organisation, it can be really, really special. More coming up on a similar theme. Um, so I'm going to introduce Jeremy Roberts shortly, but first of all, we're going to have a quick poll, uh, which we're going to pop up on your screen. Now, as I said at the beginning, don't feel that you have to take part, but this will be this will be an interesting one for us. So I'm going to give you a minute to have a quick look at that and uh, pop in your answer.
Okay, hopefully enough of you had a chance to, to have a go at clicking on the poll. Um, so should we have a quick look at the results? Okay, interesting one. So um, it looks like 58% haven't heard of Cairngorms Connect. Uh, quite a few of you have, uh, but we're going to hear a lot more about it very shortly. So Jeremy is the project manager for Cairngorms Connect. It's the UK's biggest habitat restoration project. He's worked for the RSPB for 26 years. And for 14 of those, he was the senior site manager at the RSPB's Abernethy Nature Reserve. I thoroughly recommend the visit. Uh, I've been up there. Great views of crested tits, osprey if you're lucky, uh, which holds the biggest remnant of Scotland's ancient Caledonian pine woods. Abernethy is part of Cairngorms Connect. Now I'm going to hand over to Jeremy. Thanks very much, Jamie, and uh, hi, everybody. Okay, that's together. fantastic. Thanks very much. Well, it's great to have that poll, actually, um, because I know that for, for at least 58% of you, uh, this is going to be news, which is which is really good. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Kangoms Connect, the partnership itself and the project, but then I'm obviously going to major on the woodland element. So that 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 will be the, the major part of the presentation. So this is the location of Cairngorms Connect in the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, you can see the pale green area, that's the Cairngorms National Park. Uh, and the dark green area is the Cairngorms Connect area. And then looking across at the main map there, you have in the, there are four land managing partners. And in the pale blue colour, that's uh, the land owned by the RSPB. So Abernethy Nature Reserve, which Jamie mentioned, and the Inch Marshes Reserve. Then the darker blue area is uh, owned and managed by Wildland Limited, that's um, a private landowner. And then the remaining uh, areas, the green, that's managed by Forestry and Land Scotland, what used to be the Forestry Commission, and Nature Scott, which is uh, the government agency for nature conservation in Scotland. So roughly speaking, 25% RSPB, 50% uh, wildland and the remaining 25% is the two government agencies. So an amazing partnership between private uh, um, charity and government agencies. And then a supporting partner is the uh, Kengals National Park Authority because we're roughly 13% of the national park area. So that gives you an idea of where we are, uh, uh, where we are and where we fit within Scotland and who the partners are. Um, it'd be great to whisk you all up here for a, for a quick tour, but the, the next best thing uh, is this short video, which will give you a whirlwind tour of the Cairngorms Connect area. So you'll have gathered from that video that 
Kengons Connect is, is, is about lots of different habitats. And if you want to know more about the project as a whole, then, then do visit our website. There's lots of information about, about our work there. But focusing on woodland, so this is a, a map produced by the National Park Authority. It shows the boundary of the National Park and within it, the boundary of the Kengons Connect area. The green areas are areas of existing woodland. The blue areas are areas of potential new woodland. The pink areas are areas of high altitude montane woodland. And then the white areas are areas that really won't have much tree cover at all. So at the moment we have about uh, 130 square kilometers of native woodland, of woodland rather, most of it native woodland. Uh, but the potential is to get to more than double that. Um, we, we expect the capacity to be about another 180 hectares, uh, sorry, yeah, 180 square kilometres uh, of new woodland. So we're going to talk a wee bit about that. So taking a look at some of the different woodland types, this is Abernethy, uh, the biggest remnant of ancient Caledonian pine wood. Uh, Andrew mentioned his favourite bird, uh, the nuthatch. My favourite bird is the swift. Um, and we're fortunate here, many of you will have seen swifts in towns and villages uh, nesting in and on buildings. Uh, here we actually have swifts nesting in the old uh, pine trees. It's quite something to see. So we have these big remnant uh, pine woods, quite old. Um, one of our trees dates back to 1640 when there were still wolves roaming the countryside. Uh, this is some riparian or, or riverside woodland. Uh, again, sl slightly different here, alder and, and willow dominating. We have quite a lot of plantation. Uh, much of that is Scots pine plantation. I'll say more about that in a minute. Scots pine being an, a native uh, a conifer, uh, a, a, but also a very good timber tree. So it can produce timber and be very good for wildlife. And you're also seeing here a bit of forest bog uh, where trees are growing on peatland habitats, naturally growing on the peatland. Uh, and some of these are quite amazing habitats with trees that are growing very, very slowly, stunted by the, by the wet acid conditions and a very distinct habitat type. So there are a few different woodland types within the Cairngorms Connect area. Uh, these forests are creeping up the hill uh, and the higher up we go, the more severe uh, the conditions. So the trees start to get stunted. Uh, they're quite often distorted and twisted by the wind uh, and by the poor, slow, slow growing conditions. So higher up we go, uh, we really get into some quite challenging woodland type. And then way up into the mountains, uh, this is Loch Arne Basin, part of the Abernethy Nature Reserve. Uh, and up here, clinging to one or two crags, we have some remnant willow populations here growing at 900 metres above sea level and I'll talk a bit more about those later. Incidentally, we often look across to Norway from our project as a comparison, similar climate, similar soils, similar geology, and there at 1100 meters above sea level, there's some quite convincing uh, montane woodland growing up there. So that gives us an idea of what we're aspiring to. So within our forest, there's some amazing biodiversity. Uh, and in Lee's film earlier, you saw mention of the white-tailed eagle, which we have breeding within the Kengoms Connect partnership area and nesting in trees. We also have the Capacali. Anybody who watched the Wild Isles film on woodlands uh, on Sunday will have seen displaying and fighting Capacali. Here's a, a more relaxed one. We have around about 60% of the national population of Capacali, roughly speaking, within the Cairngorms Connect area. So it's a really important uh, group of forests. And the fact that the woodlands are all connected is really meaningful for species like Capricale, which, which need big connected woodlands. We also have perhaps more subtle species. This is the twin flower, a tiny little flower growing on a little stalk, but the whole plant can extend over tens of square meters. Really impressive and, and beautiful pinewood specialist. Species like this, the devil's tooth fungus, um, with these teeth instead of the gills or the spongy un undersides that you may be used to seeing on other fungi. Pine woods are really important for, for tooth fungi. And then the marvelously named shining guest ant. You can see a, a, a normal wood ant there in the middle and then down to the left, uh, a shining guest ant, which is a 
species tolerated within these swarms of uh, ants on a major ant nest, on a big ant nest. And here's one close up. You can see why it's called the shining guest ant. Uh, and the sharp eyed amongst you will see the, the reflection of the photographer, Stuart Taylor, who took this picture in the abdomen of the ant, a really amazing species with really limited distribution. So some of these woodlands are vital for some of these rarer, um, rarer species. So let's have a look at some of the things that we're doing. I mentioned the Scots pine plantations. Many of these are, ma are managed uh, commercially and in doing so they can actually be quite good for biodiversity. They can introduce more light when timber is, is thinned out uh, and improve the condition of the field layer, which is often quite critical for species, particularly like the capercaillie. Uh, but here we're also creating deadwood. So uh, the image on the left shows trees that are being winched over and left in situ. So the, the logs will rot, the root plates provide um, uh, uh, um, opportunities for trees to regenerate into them. And they also provide opportunities for species like capercaillie dust bathing and that lower right picture shows a hen capercaillie with two of her poults, uh, young, young birds, uh, dust bathing to get rid of uh, uh, parasites. And here we have one of our local contractors, Alban Tom, helping out with some another form of deadwood creation here, ring barking some trees. They will die standing uh, and that provides opportunities for species like woodpeckers. And you can see uh, a woodpecker occupying a hole in or, or rather a hole in a tree. Uh, that's been created by a woodpecker. So restructuring these big Scots pine plantations provides immense benefit uh, for our forest biodiversity. We're also looking for opportunities to re-establish these bog, bog woodland habitats by blocking ditches. Uh, we can use turfs, we can use excavators, contractors, uh, and we often use volunteers not to actually block the ditches. We don't leave the volunteers in the ditches. Uh, they just do the dam construction work. But this can transform these drained bog woodlands uh, and reinstate habitats for the likes of dragonflies and damselflies. We also have within the project area some areas of non-native conifers uh, that have been planted for timber crops. And in the foreground of this video, you can see an area that was lodgepole pine, which is a non-native uh, pine. And here the, the pine has been removed. You can see a scattering of Scots pine that have been left uh, in situ that were in amongst the lodgepole pine. And that area will now be left to regenerate as, as native woodland. Uh, and behind that, you can see Scots pine plantation. So you can see a large area that we can work on and restructure for biodiversity whilst also producing some timber. And then in the background, as you climb up, that's Cairngorm in the background, the mountain. Uh, and where the snow is, is roughly about uh, where the tree line ought to be moving towards. So you start to get a sense of, of how these various uh, woodland elements start to fit together. And you can see on that right hand slope, some of the native woodlands creeping up the slope. So in addition, sorry, that's gone back the way. In addition to um, removing mature conifers, we're also uh, with the help of volunteers again, removing non-native regeneration, which is a major task uh, and, and will take us decades really to sort out. Expanding the forest to its natural limit, as I mentioned earlier, is our really major ambition. Um, and the best way, the main way we want to do that is by natural regeneration. And that's where seed from parent trees falls on the ground to grow as new seedlings. Uh, and then in this case, you can see that the pine trees growing on these gravel beds uh, in Glenfeshi here. And to achieve this, we manage deer populations to, redu to reduce the grazing impact. And in these images here, which are 17 years apart, you can see the difference that it makes when the trees are allowed to regenerate, there's, the grazing level is reduced. You can see the trees have come back, the heather's come back, the grass has come back. And at a landscape scale, you start to see the trees creeping up the slope, uh, as you can see in, in this image here. Where we're a long way from those seed sources, we do need to plant trees or where, where perhaps there's a, um, some species are underrepresented, then we plant trees to, to establish a seed source to kickstart the process. And to help with that at Abernethy, there is a tree nursery 
Uh, it's growing a wide diversity or all broadleaf species because these are quite often the ones that are, are missing. Um, but in particular, what we're doing here is working on those montane willows that I referred to earlier on. So we're collecting cuttings, collecting seed, growing them on in the tree nursery. And then this is David, who's our tree nursery manager. And in those bags, he has uh, the, the trees that have been grown in the tree nursery. Uh, and these we then, with the help of staff and volunteers, we have an annual willow walk where we car carry these willow trees uh, in rucksacks up into the mountains. It's quite a trek, it's 500 meters of ascent, 500 meters of descent uh, to take them to where they need to be planted. These species were there, but grazing by goats, sheep, uh, deer and so on have removed uh, the, those, those plants are just clinging on to ledges. Many of them uh, either male or female, single species, so we need to mix things up a bit. So when we get down to the other side, they get a good drink of water. Uh, and then the next phase is to get them planted. And so by doing that, we diversify the genetics uh, and we provide thousands of trees, which then can then uh, start to provide a seed source uh, for the expansion of the, of the montane willows. The woodlands that we have are spectacular. They're there, obviously, for wildlife, but they're there for people as well. Um, we, anybody that's been to the Cairngorms uh, or anybody enjoy, that enjoys their local woodlands, you know, they're important for locally, culturally, uh, for recreation. We have businesses that uh, that have have a role uh, or an involvement in the uh, in the existence of these woodlands and the spectacular forests that we have. Um, and the, the cultural importance uh, was brought to the fore for us by Hamish Napier, a, a local um, award-winning folk museum. I mean, work, <laughs> folk museum, folk musician. And we worked with Hamish. We sponsored this album in which Hamish uh, celebrated uh, the woods of the Cairngorms Connect, Connect area and the species uh, that we have growing here. So check that out uh, if, if you're interested. I wanted to say a bit also about woodlands and rivers. Um, this is spectacular Glen Feshi. Um, and where we have around about 20% of the catchment of the river Spey uh, is within the Cairngorms Connect area. So much of the river uh, of the Spey, 20% of it running through our woodlands, um, and that, that confers certain benefits on the river, certain qualities. So one is that it ensures that we get some nice clean water. A wooded catchment gives you clean water. A wooded catchment also slows the movement of water through the catchment, uh, which therefore reduces the risk of downstream flooding. So trees can fulfill a, some really important roles uh, in, in, our, in our river systems. And in particular, riparian woodlands that provide shade uh, and that keep the temperature down. With climate change, we're certainly seeing an increase in river temperatures, and that's really bad news for species such as salmon. So by having wooded catchments, we have cleaner water, we have less flood risk, but we also have cooler rivers, uh, which is really good for some of our river biodiversity. Andrew touched on the carbon importance of woodland, so by making our forests bigger, uh, natural regeneration, expanding up the hill, more than twice the size of the, size of the existing woodlands. Uh, we are capturing carbon from the atmosphere and that really helps uh, to address the, both, the, both the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. And it's great that we get involvement from local schools. This is one of the local high schools who came for a day out with, with Lotta here, our community education officer. And here they're learning about Cairngorms Connect and climate change. And there's a, a QR code that will take them straight to information about how habitat restoration uh, benefits uh, um, our net zero objectives and how we address the impacts of climate change. I wanted to say something very briefly about science, which is a really important part of our project and is a, a really strong foundation to the work that we do. It's all of our work is underpinned by a very strong science foundation. And that includes 200 year, a 200 year monitoring framework. 
So some of the restoration the work, work that we're doing, including expansion of the forest to its natural limit, we know will take 200 years if we're to do it by natural regeneration. So we want to know how we're getting on doing that, how, how it's progressing. So we use in particular, there's a moth trap there. Um, we use moths as indicators. They're very quick to respond to change. So we can monitor moths and see how the population is changing in response in this example to the expansion of the forest. And we also know that with the deadwood creation work that we do, that beetles respond uh, very quickly to the creation of deadwood. So on that, that phone shot, screenshot there, you can see um, that's a longhorn beetle. And the, these are, these, this is a species that responds to deadwood creation. So we use beetles as an indicator for that. Science is really crucial to the work that we do. Finally, I want to say a little bit about funding. So we, in 2019, we were one of the eight projects across Europe to ben benefit from the Endangered Landscapes Programme, which is a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and, and Peter Baldwin. And that gave us five million US dollars to underpin the project, which has been a huge boost. And you can imagine the sorts of work that we're talking about uh, doesn't come cheap, some of it. So it's really helpful to have that. And that includes supporting the science work the, the communications work and so on. And we've also benefited from support from Scottish forestry grant schemes and Pe um, Peatland Action Fund and other, other projects like that. So for example, restoring forest bogs, that's a peatland habitat. So we've benefited in that way. So that's it from me. Um, I look forward to having any of your questions uh, and uh, I'll hand back to Jamie and say thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. That was that was brilliant. And I, I'm just blown away by some of the stuff in that pre presentation. And what I really, really love about Ken Goms Connect is the way that part of the vision involves people. So people are not like separate from from that kind of world that, that is being created by Ken Goms Connect. They're, 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 they're in there. There's, there's, there's holiday makers. There's people that live locally. There's industry. There's conservation there's children coming it's just brilliant absolutely amazing project so jeremy do stay on for questions uh, and uh, if you'd like to put your questions for jeremy in the q a box uh, lee and andrew i'm going to invite you back onto the screen or invite you onto the screen for the first time probably lee um now let's just have a quick look at questions we've we've been plowing through them as they've been coming in and actually we've answered quite a few but there's one that andrew spotted that would be good i think for him to answer which is from sophie and sophie says if the UK's forest cover is 13%, is there an ideal percentage for forest cover? Like, is there a number that we're aiming for or is it not that simple? Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Sophie. A really interesting question. Um, and I could just cop out and say it's not that simple <laughs> and leave it alone. But I thought it's worth having a go at. So um first of all forestry is a devolved matter across the four countries of of the uk so it's up to the individual governments to set their their own aspirations um the committee for climate change has suggested that we need about thirty thousand hectares per year across the uk and current targets within the four countries sort of add up to a, just a little bit more than that, that which is a good thing but they don't address some of the big questions which is around what kind of trees uh we want so we do, and there's been some questions in the chat about this, we do support, the RSPB does support the need for commercial forestry for domestic timber supply. We don't want to just offshore our environmental uh, problems because, you know, timber is a good thing to use, especially in, um, in comparison to concrete or steel, which have a much higher carbon uh, footprint so emissions go in, into the atmosphere as long as we keep regrowing the trees they can be uh, a lower carbon uh, alternative so it, it becomes about what trees and then you have to think about the splits how much do we want to be commercial how much do we want to be uh, native primarily aimed at, at conservation can we have some that are native broad leaves that are for timber production wouldn't that be wonderful um, and then there's things like agroforestry and thinking about trees outside of woods so so the answer is that there are individual targets people haven't really thought about where where we're ultimately going to but probably you know people are so focused on net zero by 2050 or 2045 in scotland 
but perhaps we ought to be thinking about you know the real long-term aim is towards a doubling of woodland and forest cover from where we are now but that's split differently between the countries so I, by memory please don't test me on this uh but i think scotland has about 17 or 18 percent forest cover uh England has about 10%, I think Wales about 13%, and I'm going to say, and this is the one I'm really weakest on, uh, Northern Ireland has about 6%, but it could be 8%, one of one of those two, I think, definitely not 7%. Uh, so I, I hope that helps. It's a really interesting topic, but yeah, from a, I, I think the idea that we want to keep expanding beyond 2050 and trying to find the right trees for the right reasons and put them in the right places. Can I just give us a, a small um, sort of case study of that? Um, so for the Lake District National Park, um, that has about 12, 13 percent woodland cover. So it, it's sort of representative of, of England as a whole. Um, there's been an example, um, some study done to look at where the trees might go. Um, and bracken is a really good indicator. It's, it, it shows where the soils are appropriate. And that covers probably an additional 12 to 13 percent again. So that that would be the right place to put the trees it would be a place where there's very little agricultural benefit uh where there's not very much existing wildlife interest so you know that that kind of doubling for for a you know discrete area of the lake district national park is 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 kind of in line what andrew says for the kind of broader national picture thank you thank you both very much i'm going to go back to jeremy now so this is a question from trisha and um, about scott's pines growing in the bog <laughs> Does it mean they drain the bog or do they kind of stabilize it? How does how does that work? You're on mute, I think. Yeah, yeah so um, they don't so much as drain the bog. They, they Their growth is quite restricted. So they obviously, they, they lift some water out of the bog. Um, but the, 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 the limiting factor for their growth is the wetness of the bog. So if you like, they don't get so big that they're ever gonna drain it. And in fact, quite often they get so big that they fall over. Um, and then they create a pool that, that, that dragonflies occupy. So they're not, they're not really draining the bog uh, in any significant sense. And it's an, in, it's an entirely naturally occurring habitat. So uh, if you go to any of the forests in the, in the sort of boreal area, you'll find these bog woodlands. Uh, they're quite dramatic places, but yeah, they're not draining the bog. Oh, thank you very much. So, um... Let's talk a bit about grazing because grazing is a really, really interesting topic. Um, there is a question from Honor who says, do we use cattle grazing, goats, etc., in the woodlands? What, what what are we all trialing as part of you know different grazing projects at the moment? Let's go to so Lee. I can say I can say we've oh, about that, about that, Jenny. Um, so certainly um, at one time there would have been perhaps aurochs, a kind of early, early cattle in some of our woodlands here. Um, wild boar uh, would have been in the in the area as well so there would have been quite a lot of ground disturbance uh, and at Abernethy at the moment there is a trial underway uh, funded by uh, life funding and the endangered landscapes program and that's trialing cattle to to diversify the ground conditions within the forest and in particular to see whether it benefits capercaillie um, so there's a suggestion that some of the long, tall vegetation that we have in the forest now might be disadvantageous to capercaillie. So the, the work there is to see whether it's it's beneficial to them. But it's very low density grazing. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, I've got a question from a uh, Eamon here, which is what is the greatest threat to ancient woodlands and what can we do to help preserve ancient woodlands? So that's for Andrew. OK, uh, yeah, thanks. Another another good question. Um, for me, it's absolutely shocking that that we still don't have full protection for ancient woodlands. We're down to 2.5% of the land cover. Uh, some of them are protected because they're already in protected areas, but we know that, that too many are lost and too many are, are under threat. So I would just say across each of the four countries, um, giving them the equivalent of special site of special scientific interest uh, status would would be the the one thing we really should be should be looking to do um we hosted the um cop 26 in in glasgow in 2021 and the first action from that 
uh, in the uh, Glasgow um, Leaders Declaration on Forests and Land Use was to conserve and restore uh, forests. Now that's globally, and we should be really gra grabbing the, the the potential to show global leadership uh, in, in this area. Having hosted that where the declaration was signed, we should be stepping up and showing on the world stage that we can do that. We can acknowledge our mistakes and say, yes, we're down, we have so little left, but acknowledging that we're now really, really protecting it. And I know it's difficult for landowners who've got uh, ancient woodlands as part of their, you know, their, their land ownership, but we've got to find ways around that. We've got to find ways of saying this is precious, you know, we can support it, um, not just the protection, but the restoration to, to really good condition as well. Thank you very much, Andrew. Now, there's a really interesting question that's coming from Katie, who's she's addressed it to Jeremy, but I'm gonna I'm gonna apply it to Lee as well. So um she talks about um how that um many species are surviving on the edge of existence as their ideal habitat's been destroyed. And we often learn with hindsight that if we get out of the way and observe things, things get better. Um, so she's asking how we assume to know better, e.g., with planting, why not let it restore itself? Now I know we we've talked about that kind of nature restoring itself and obviously that takes a really long time i want to the reason i want to go to lee first because i know there's a really interesting project at horsewater with particularly alpine plants um so with that kind of thing lee why don't we let them restore themselves is, there's a there's a reason isn't there for kind of going in there and getting the seedlings and going up the hills and planting them yeah i mean it's basically we we've modified the landscape so heavily we've degraded it so heavily over the course of you know many hundreds of years that in some circumstances, we've we've kind of pushed it beyond the point at which it can recover by itself. So, you know, the work that we're doing with the alpine plants, they're growing in these tiny, tiny little refuges on cliffs and crags. Um, you know, very likely, it's difficult to find loads of evidence to, to, to this effect, but it's more than likely that these species were much more widespread historically. Um, but starting from such a low base, it's very, very difficult for them to spread out into the wider landscape again. So what we're doing at Horsewater and, and, and indeed across the RSPB estate in, in certain places is to really restore, to, to get these natural processes operating and to get natural regeneration working. We need to kind of pump prime it, if you like. So we need to get a future seed source back out into the landscape, be that alpine plants, be that trees or, or shrub species. Um, and yes, we maybe things would recover if we waited long enough. But I think time is a luxury that we don't really have. You know, the, the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis are escalating at such a speed that I think we, there is there is a strong argument for intervention in, in certain places. Um, and that's certainly the kind of principle that we're following here at Horsewater. Yeah, Thanks, Jamie, can I... Jeremy, same for you. Yeah, yeah. I, absolutely. Lee, Lee took the words out of my mouth in terms of pump priming. And I think one of the things that's worth bearing in mind is if you think of a seed and a seed, first of all, the seed has to land on some on some suitable surface material for germinating a, a seedbed of some sort. When it germinates, it then has to survive slugs. Uh, if it gets beyond the slug predation stage, it has to survive voles. If it gets beyond the vole stage, mountain hares. If it gets beyond the mountain hare stage, deer. So you can see there's quite a chat and that's assuming that that seed is even viable. So we need a lot of seed. And I, and I did see uh, somebody posted a question about scattering seed. And certainly we're doing that with um, with birch seed in some places. Um, but when, for example, our montane willows, seeds really hard to get. Um, and and there's that level of predation that where we know that we need to establish a seed source from which we then get the forest to expand, uh, it, it makes sense to plant. But as I said, um, uh, in my presentation by far the the biggest majority of the new woodland we get will be, be by natural regeneration but it's Thank a great you. question yeah yeah it's really really good question um i'm going to go over to andrew now because um i've got a question about lesser spotted woodpecker um michael's written about a lesser spotted woodpecker that he saw about 10 years ago in a small woodland and he's saying that habitat hasn't changed uh, so so his local small woodland hasn't changed but um the, the woodpecker is now not there what other reasons are there for what these these birds disappearing? Do we know? Do we know the, the sort of reasons behind lesser spotted woodpecker decline? 
Uh, yeah, it's it's a good question. Um, I think essentially what happened with lesser spotted woodpecker is there was a peak um, in their population. Well, it's, I suppose it's a long term decline, but there was a peak which was associated with Dutch elm disease, funnily enough, because that created a lot of dead wood in our in our woodlands uh, and the uh, lesser spotted woodpecker as a you know as you would imagine that's a that's a niche habitat for for it so whilst there was a lot of dead wood at that stage uh, their populations could could increase and then the, the sort of longer term trend of, of decline has come back in but they are also affected by by a disease um which the name of which on the, on the spur of the moment escapes me i think lee might know it we'll we'll see if we can test him as well um but yeah so there are there are associated issues and we should also remember that our our climate is changing um and that most of our woodlands are small isolated vulnerable fragments so they're already not in good condition we shouldn't make the mistake of looking at a habitat and thinking that a species is there and it's thriving um you know we need to expand our woodlands in the right way, but we desperately need to improve the condition of our, our woodlands as well. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I've got a question about willow cuttings. I think this is from, from you, Jeremy, from your presentation. Bupinda says, what time of year do you take the cuttings and how long do you grow them in the nursery before you plant them out? Yeah, so um really when the when the leaves are off so when the plants are dorm, dormant that's when that's done and it's uh, quite often volunteers that go out and do that it's a great a great day out uh, collecting the cuttings most of them go into the nursery for at least two years um some of them to be honest once they've gone in will stay and then we'll take cuttings from them as well so uh, they they have multiple benefits however some of the willows on the lower ground we will take them straight from the from the shrub from the plant itself and stick them straight into boggy ground and anybody that knows what willows like if you put a willow cutting in in water or in soil it quite often strikes straight away but for the montane willows we want really strong really good roots uh, so they'll be in the tree nursery for a couple of years before we then lift them uh, and take them back out thank you thank you very much um, I'm just having a quick scroll through some of the other questions. Um, Lee, there was one for you earlier, which you answered, but I just wondered if you wanted to talk, talk a bit more about it, because Horsewater has got a really interesting long term strategy. Um, and I think the question was about whether we had some a bit of long, long term funding. That was from Linda. So uh, uh, as they kind of like what, what's happening with the future of um, Horsewater in that in, in those terms? Yeah, funding is 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 obviously always the challenge for, for doing nature conservation work and indeed for farming. Um, this is a really kind of interesting area that's that's changing a huge amount at the moment. Um, since we've left the European Union, um, government has been in the process of designing a domestic um, farming support scheme. And, and the, the funding streams that support farming are, are pretty much the same ones that support nature conservation. It's, it's funding for land management in effect. Um, so one thing that is in development at the moment is something called landscape recovery, which is the, the highest tier of this new environmental land management scheme um, sort of system that's, that's being developed. Um, and Horswater um, is one of 22 pilots across England. Um, and we've got a two year development phase. So we were kind of working up the plans, sort of putting the detail into the vision that we've got for Horswater, which was presented in that film. And we hope that will lead to a 20 year um, delivery phase where we where we receive support from government and from private sources as well. One of the unique things about this is it's blending public and private finance um, and that we hope will will sustain us and, uh, and allow us to kind of realise that vision that we we presented in that film there. Thanks Lee. Big question for Rachel, for Andrew, um, this is about climate change. So with the, the temperatures rising, will the current native trees being planted and in existence be the most appropriate species for the future? Yeah, I think that's a fascinating question. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I think it's worth thinking. Of, uh, I'm not a geneticist, but I think it's worth thinking about genetic variability here. So our native woodlands have, have developed over um, you know, thousands of years and the climate has been changing uh, during that time. What we're talking about now is the, the increased human impact on the climate. But those trees are adapted 
And, you know, with that genetic variability, some of them will do better with rising temperatures um, and some may not. But overall, the woodland should have enough diversity within it of species and within within species to survive. Woodlands also create their own sort of microclimate. You know, if you go into a woodland, it feels different to outside of it. So I'm I'm pretty confident that our native woodlands are more resilient to climate change than people necessarily think what we have got are our events like drought and and wildfire which will will make it different difficult difficult but that would be difficult for, those would be difficult for any tree species type and there is work going on to consider whether we should use uh, native tree species but from further south for me in france for example but i'm Personally, I'm I'm not convinced that we've bottomed out yet how resilient our, our woodlands are, are to climate change. And I would like to see more work uh, in investigating that. And I always come back to this idea that, you know, Dutch elm disease in the 1970s and 80s, apart from the spike I talked about earlier for the lesser spotted woodpecker, was, you know, was a disaster for an individual tree species. But none of the woodlands disappeared because other trees took their places, because if you've got diversity, you've got that ability to bounce back. And now, especially with witch elm, we're seeing more and more, you know, elm as an understory tree in the landscape. And we need to take the long view sometimes and think about, you know, what's good for this woodland for hundreds of years, not just right now, this second. Thank you. Oh, Jeremy, one, one final point from Jeremy. Yeah, just very quickly to chip in on the back of what Andrew said, big forests are more robust in the face of climate change. So, you know, if you have a fire or you have a disease or you have a, a, a significant um, wind throw event where, where trees are blown over by, by, by a storm, then that, that can have a devastating effect on a small woodland. On a big forest, the impact is less. And in fact, it can it can, but not ideal, but it can create some diversity within within the forest. So yeah, and Andrew's point is absolutely right. We need bigger forests to be more robust in the face of climate change. Thank you. Thank you all very much. That's about all we have time for. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I hope you found this as interesting and as informative as I, as I have. As mentioned earlier, a short survey will pop up on your screen once this webinar is finished, and we'd love to hear your feedback on how we can improve events like this in the future. Thank you to Andrew, Lee and Jeremy for their fantastic talks and videos. If you've enjoyed this webinar, please join us next week on the 28th at 12 p.m. where we'll be diving into the world of the white-tailed eagle and the golden eagle as seen in episode one. The link to register for this webinar is included in the survey. Thank you everyone very much and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.